Salutations to the Truth Corps, whoever and wherever you may be on the planet. I'm pretty sure that some of you by now are getting it the way I come across. You know, I like to tease and tantalize and uh, play with you off and on. Remember, if you can't play with it, it's delusional. And that's as true for the living gnosis today as it is for anything else. So I play around in one way or the other, or the other, or another. And I like to remind you sometimes to pull up your pajamas, your jammies, as we say in American jargon. Not too tight, but just snug. But in this case, in this instance, for this message, you might want to take it in the raw and strip those jammies right off. What I'm going to say now is extremely esoteric. So I am talking to the public in the way that I talk to the insiders in my cult, my educational Gnostic cult of Nemeta. And doing so, I have the privilege to offer you the premium Gnostic intel on the planet as Shaktas and Kalikas enjoy it. So enjoy it. Enjoyment, you could say, is the surest path of learning. Now, There's a book called Creative Mythology, written by Joseph Campbell. Now it's been said that I am the heir or successor of Joseph Campbell in some respect. Well, I certainly wouldn't make that claim, but I wouldn't reject it either. It's true in the sense that he was a comparative mythologist and so am I. Now, Campbell, along with Merce Eliade, died in the 1980s. That's a good while ago. So I might be the only comparative mythologist surviving on the planet today. In creative mythology, Joseph Campbell proposed a program, a framework for creative mythology. And it consists of four propositions that he introduces in the beginning of the book and picks up again in the end of the book. So I would place myself in the lineage of Joseph Campbell due to having taken those protocols for creative mythology and put them into action. So I practice creative mythology, but I call it directive mythology. And another way I can put it is to say that I teach self-direction through mythology and through mythic narratives, which you can live. The value of these narratives is not merely to provide you with, with a tool to interpret your experience, but they can actually direct and inspire your experience, especially the unique narrative of the fallen goddess scenario, the home story. Now in this volume of creative mythology, additional to making these proposals or setting out a framework for the mythology of the future, Joseph Campbell delves deeply into the Grail legend. 
And the Grail is a legend. It has a mythic dimension, but technically speaking, it is a legend and it is grounded in historical facts. So I have argued in my book, The Alternative History of the Grail, that the company of the Grail, the people described in this legend, were the diaspora of the mysteries who fled from the Middle East to the far west lands of Europe and established themselves in a secret community there under the protection of the Knights of the Round Table, the chivalric order that was founded by the Welsh shaman Merlin. The time when these events actually occurred when the Round Table of Arthurian Knights was founded can be placed very closely to the lifetime of Hypatia, who died in 415 at the hands of a Christian mob. So look at the date 415 for a moment and then come ahead eight centuries to the date 1215. That is the date of the Fourth Lateran Council, which was an event, obviously, held by the authorities of the Catholic Church at that time. Now, Campbell gives some close consideration to the correlation of the writing of the Grail in the version of Wolfram von Eschenbach to these events in the world in which he lived, in Christianized Europe. Europe has never been Christian. Europe is not a Christian nation. It is a Christianized nation or group of nations. And Campbell was really explicit in saying that there were certain historical events in 1215 that corresponded to some elements in the narrative of Parzival by von Eschenbach. And that narrative is said to have been completed around 1220. So you see the timing is really, really close. So what was the primary contemporary event that Joseph Campbell examined in connection with the Grail legend. It was the Fourth Lateran Council. So what transpired at that event, in that event, and why is it important today? How does it come forward to now? Before I explain that, I just want to draw an analogy. You could say that the various councils of the Vatican, of the Catholic Church, the various congregations of the authorities and the bishops and so forth, which were numerous all through the Middle Ages, are like events happening today, such as the Bilderberg Group meeting or the meeting of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, in Davos. And just as those who gather in Davos are planning the Great Reset, not just theoretically, but they are implementing through the means at their disposal, through money and media influence and corrupt politicians, they are implementing their plan. Well, likewise, that is exactly what the Catholic authorities did in these councils. I know that it seems extremely remote today and archaic and irrelevant to take note that the Pope issued a bull, a papal bull, or an encyclical, I think it's called, back in that time and wrote it on a doc document, parchment, and sealed it with the Vatican seal and then circulated it across the Christianized countries. And so what? The Pope made a declaration on a piece of paper. That's exactly what's happening today, for instance, with the manifesto for the Great Reset. 
Now I have in my hands this volume of creative mythology. It's sort of like a telephone book. You could knock a Talmudic rabbi into a coma with this thing. And I have it open to page 541. And I'm just going to read you the paragraph, a single paragraph, about the fourth letter in council. That was the event that established the Catholic dogma of the real presence of Christ's body in the sacraments. So, Campbell's, Campbell's cites in Latin and then in English what the council declared. Quote, There is verily one true universal church outside of which no one whosoever is saved, in which one and the same Jesus Christ is himself both priest and sacrifice, whose body and blood are truly contained in the sacrament of the altar under the species of bread and wine, the bread being transubstantiated into the body and the wine into the blood by the power of God so that through the accomplishment of this mystery of unity we receive him unto ourselves that he unto himself may receive us." End quote. So you see prior to that time when the sacrament was administered as a ritual of the Catholic Church, a ritual of atonement and redemption, it was somewhat vague but it was more or less received by the people who performed the sacrament as a symbolic act. So the bread symbolized the flesh of the Savior and the wine symbolized the blood of the Savior. But according to the doctrine of transubstantiation, the bread is actually the flesh and the wine is actually and really materially the blood. So take that on board for a moment. One thing you could say about that right off the top is that the Fourth Lateran Council instated a rite of cannibalism. So in fact, when Catholics eat the sacrament wafer and drink the wine, they are cannibalizing the body of the sacrificed Savior who is said to represent the, the unique divine human hybrid, Jesus Christ, and who is widely taken to this day as the icon and example of the most perfect human being and the image of human divinity. Now, without getting into the particulars of the correlation or the relevance of this event, to the events in the company of the Grail, the diaspora of the mysteries who were living at that time, I would just like to point out one feature, one circumstance. Remember the interval of 415 AD or CE to 1215. That's 800 years, that's let's say 24 generations, more like 30, because life was short in those days. And during those 24 generations, the company of the Grail, who had taken refuge in the Westlands, in Wales, the British Isles, Scotland, and Ireland, lived in seclusion, and they continued to observe their own sacrament, so they had a sacramental ritual. And this ritual is in fact the method of the mysteries, the method of instruction in the mystery schools, instruction by the light. So these heirs in the lineage of the mysteries, living in seclusion and protected in Europe, continued to perform entheogenic rites 
using psychoactive plants. That was their sacramental ritual of observance that brought them into intimate beholding of the Aeon Sophia. It brought them to the encounter with the organic light, which is the attainment of the grail. So they rightfully can be called the keepers of the grail because they kept this sacrament. You can be sure that those living at that time, the beginning of the 13th century, were acutely aware of the apposition between the Catholic dogma of transubstantiation and their own practices. Can you see that? Apposite. The one was apposite to the other. And they saw, and rightfully so, a tremendous threat coming through this dogma. A threat of an evil spell. The threat of evil, nefarious magic proceeding from the Catholic ritual of the Mass. And they took this really, really seriously. And it's uh, my opinion, although it's extremely hard to find any literary or historical evidence outside of the Grail legend itself, but it's my opinion that they regarded this as a threat display and they took it as a sign that they needed to go even deeper underground. Problem I had in writing the alternative history of the Grail was that I could track the Grail forward from the end of the mysteries in the 5th century CE, 800 years but the trail goes cold after 1200. And it is, I was not able to satisfactorily complete that book until now because there is almost no surviving historical evidence or not even the slightest clue of what the company of the Grail did at that moment when they went from refuge into deeper, deeper refuge and into total concealment. And that concealment did not end until the middle of the 20th century and the discovery of LSD for one thing, the discovery of the Nag Hammadi writings, but principally in the work that came into the world at that time Note the title of a book, The Road to Eleusis, written by Albert Hoffman and Schultes, I believe. Schultes was a botanist at Harvard. So the reappearance of the entheogenic mysteries occurred in the middle of the 20th century. And between that time, going all the way back, there you have it, another 800 years, 12, 15 to, well, 2015, bringing it up into the 21st century, during that time, it is almost impossible to trace the history of the Grail Keepers. But they are here today, alive and well. And there are those who preserve the sacred legacy of the Grail Keepers and who practice those shamanic rites with entheogenic plants, psychoactive plants. So the method of the mysteries survives today in practice, in reality, and it is at the core of the living gnosis today. I could talk for four solid hours on this topic, but to my intention to bring this talk in under 40 minutes and not four hours and as well under 40 minutes as I possibly can. To do that, I'm going to cut to the chase. 
I'm going to update the entire scenario to its present day manifestation in the world. A number of insightful people have remarked that there is a religion arising around quantum 19. I'm going to call it the religion of quantum 19. And this religion has its rituals such as social distancing, hand washing, and it has its sacred attire such as the wearing of the mask or of the face shield or even complete body suits or bubble domes over the head or bubble domes over the entire body. These are the accessories of the new religion that is arising due to quantum 19. I don't think it's a far stretch to call it a religion. In fact, isn't it becoming more and more obvious day by day that this is the case. So the behavior of those who are inducted into this religion, who join this religion, is typical of any religion. Uh, they shame outsiders. They consider those who do not adhere to the religion to be sinful and even polluted, biologically polluted, you see. So the concept of sin in the Catholic Church is now, has now been replaced and upscaled into the concept of biological pollution. And if you do not worship at the altar of quantum 19, then you're a sinner and you should be cast out because you might spread sin to everyone whom you contact. Of course, in this case, let's look at what the sin is. Well, you know, there are many, many sins in Catholicism. There are many sins in, in Islam. And there are some sins in Christianity. But what are the sins in the quantum 19 religion? Well, primarily the first sin is breathing. By the mere fact of being a human animal, a live human being, a carbon-based animal, you are committing the sin of being alive. And you are committing the sin of taking pleasure in life. You are committing the sin of living freely without harming or deceiving others so that you can go about your way in life with a free conscience and not be concerned that anyone would impede you from living you are impeded from living because everything that you do normally can now be considered a sin in this new religion. I'm sure I don't have to elaborate. It elaborates itself very nicely. Thank you. To continue the parallel, go back to the fourth Lateran Council. According to that dictate and the papal bull, which is no different than the manifesto of the Great Reset, the bread and the wine of the sacramental ritual of Mass is actually transubstantiated into the flesh and blood of the Redeemer. It's a high act of magic. So that's the sacrament of the Catholic Church coming forward to its reflection and counterpart today, its amplification, exponentially far more evil than it was 800 years ago. What is the sacrament of the religion of quantum 19? Vaccination. That is the Archontic Sacrament. Vaccination, the proposed 
vaccination of everyone in the world to prevent the spread of quantum 19 is the Archontic Eucharist. So what the globalists, the internationalists, the technocratic masterminds of the planet, the transhumanists, are all doing together in their great cabal kitchen is they are preparing the Archonic Eucharist. Now it remains to be seen, many questions are still open, and I do not by any means hold the view that their plan can succeed. As a matter of fact, I'll go on record as saying the Great Reset cannot not fail. But in the process of finding out if that is true or not, some really hellacious things are going to come down on this planet. Now it's not clear yet about compliance. You know, the word compliance is very tricky. You can have free compliance. I say to you, I drive up to your house in my 57 Chevy and I say, let's go have lunch at the Aztec Cafe. And you say, oh, no, John, I'm, I, don't, I don't comply. I don't feel like going today. Okay, fine. But if I pull out my Glock and point it at you, then you're looking at a situation of compliance under threat. Compliance under threat is not the same as free compliance. So the word compliance you find today in the way it is used is deceitful and disingenuous. Same for the word mandatory. Oh, it's only guidelines. No, it's really mandatory. No, it's not guidelines. All of this is calculated to create fear, confusion, and cognitive dissonance, which goes to the advantage of the perpetrators of the Quantum 19 hoax. But they are actually constructing a real religion based on that hoax, on that provable medical fraud. So as I said, it remains to be seen how this is going to play out. But let's just say that the globalist powers, the authorities, the archontic agents among us, try to enforce it. They try to make it compulsory. So, let's say they try to do that. How is that going to play out? Well, there are three possibilities. There are people who will comply and who will line up for the vaccine and they're already doing that. There are people who might be forced to take the vaccine. They might be vaccinated against their will, okay? And then the third category are those people who will refuse it categorically and will fight to their death not to be vaccinated if that's what it takes. Now already today, you can see how this situation is shaping up. Those who adhere to the religion of quantum 19 regard those who do not adhere as heretics, sinful, and dangerous people. And so, they exhibit, the Covidiots, as they're called, they exhibit a hateful attitude toward those who defy the program, don't they? And they shame them publicly. And the shaming of them also is a big issue in the mainstream media. And so it proceeds. So it's very, very clearly a mass religious event that's taking place. And the Eucharist of the Archonic religion is the vaccine. So there it is.
it looks like I'm coming in well under the 40 minute limit. That's great. But what can I say in conclusion? What can I give you for a takeaway? I saw a meme the other day that said something like this. The media does not report on the silent majority because the media is silent on the majority. And that is a very great fact. And so, if you just go by the media today, you might be brainwashed into thinking that the majority of human animals living on this planet willingly want to take the iconic Eucharist. But that is not true. That is not true. And I am certain that the majority of people in the world don't want to take it. And that their refusal and defiance is growing and escalating exponentially day by day. I repeat again, I do not predict, I do not say the Great Reset will fail. I do not say the transhumanist psychopathic, life-hating, biophobic ghouls running the program will not succeed, I say that they cannot not fail. They are attempting to commit the greatest crime against humanity that has ever occurred in all of human history. And in doing so, they are taking on the inherent force of humanity such as it exists, such as it survives, the genuine force of humanity rises against them as they proceed to try to implement their plan. You know, there's a lot of talk coming from these people, but it's plans, it's talks, it's organizations, it's the IMF, it's the WHO, it's the BIS, the Bank of International Settlements. It's all these corporate organisms. They're not organisms. All these corporate egregores and all of these foundations and these humanitarian organizations and all of these systems and all these programs. Every day you hear more and more about a new program has been created. And that's all just piss in the wind because they have to implement their programs. They use their programs and they broadcast them as a threat display. And they count on people being so frightened that they will submit when the moment comes that they implement their plans. But the, when the moment comes for them to implement their plans, as the Gnostics warned us at the consummation of the work of the Archons, their program cannot not fail. So I leave you with that assertion. I speak with great confidence as a Gnostic, but you can take it as an article of faith if you like. Faith in humanity, call it whatever you like. To me, it's faith in the wisdom goddess, faith in the Anthropos, and in the Rome, the races of the world faith in their ability to reclaim their sovereign power, you can call it faith. I would prefer to say, I'm confident they can do it in the measure that is required to defeat the archontic program, which you may now regard as a religion, the religion of terror. Enough said. And I'll be seeing you in the beauty to come.